good to have you gather to worship this morning on this. Yeah, yeah, come here say this beautiful day in the Lord's house. It is. Even with snow on the ground, there's not snow on the road. And um, we're not in Denver today. Uh, one of my friends I saw this morning, they had, he pastors in Greeley, and they had 10 inches of snow as of 4.30 in the morning. So we'll take some moisture and enjoy the fact that we can get out and worship the Lord together today. Uh, a few announcements as we get uh, started this morning. Uh, just to give you a reminder, we're working through this um, series doing Lent uh, called AHA, uh, talking about the recognition of what God does in our lives and responding to Him. And so I uh, continue to pray that God will be with us there. We're updating our church directory, so back on the back counter you'll see um, a notebook that's got a directory in it. So just take a look at your uh, information, make sure it's correct. Uh, if you need to change some things, there's some sheets back there. You can fill that out and uh, just leave it with the directory, and then we'll make sure that we get those corrected. Our goal is to have this ready for us. We can have some new directories out by Easter, so I uh, would encourage you for that. Speaking of Easter, um, it's going to be April the 4th. It's a wonderful time of celebration. We're going to have an Easter breakfast at 9 o'clock. Uh, we're going to be gathering food together. It'll be a little bit different uh, than it has been in the past. Then we'll have some people who are going to serve that food. Uh, you'll come through the line and instead of just like you know, kind of picking your own stuff, they'll be there to serve you and, and do that in kind of a safe way. And then we'll use the fellowship hall for eating together. Um, so it'll be, it'll be juice and, and fruit and those kind of things, just like our regular breakfast. The only really difference is we'll have people serving uh, the food. So that'll be at 9 o'clock. Worship at 10 o'clock. We'll also have goodie bags for the kids. Uh, special children's time as well on that Sunday morning. So we gather together to celebrate and worship the Lord on Easter Sunday. Also, you'll see in your, uh, when you came in, there's a, a handout regarding Holy Week services. Those are the morning services we have as, as a community. Um, the first one is going to be at our church on Monday morning, and then Cedar Creek Church, Celebration Church, All Saints Anglican Church, and the Church on the Hill uh, will be hosting this year. So I encourage you to come and, and take part in that. It's always fun to gather with other brothers and sisters from other churches. Uh, I just have a wonderful time when I gather together with other people who, who worship the Lord. Uh, together. Women's Craft Night, you'll see the information down there, Monday, March 22nd, it's at 6.30, uh, cost is $3. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet also on the back counter, or talk to Kathy Walters, and she'll have all that information for you uh, as well. We're also working on a spring clean day. Um, uh, as many of you probably know, we have a, a, an Adventist church that worships in this building on Saturday. They, 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 they pay rent to us and use this building on Saturday. We're talking with them, so if they're able to um, adjust their schedule of worship different so we can come and be here for a little plan for the 27th uh, to do a spring clean. Uh, another thing is uh, Luana Mullins, who's been uh, one of our pianists, so coming forward for several years, Luana is um, at a place where she's not able to play the piano anymore, and we want to just say thank you to her uh, for her ministry to us. So beginning next week, we're going to receive a love offering for her, and so might just pray about what God would have you use to bless her and let her know we've appreciated all of her ministry to us in the previous years. There's other announcements also in your bulletin to take, take note of. Uh, be aware of each of those. Also, we're looking to expand our children's ministry. I'll talk a little bit about that in our prayer time. So we're going to worship the Lord together this morning. But before we do, uh, Brother Connor uh, is, is graduating from the ranch. And so he's going to come and share a word of testimony with us as we pray him out. Jesus never left my side and got me through 
too many near-death experiences. God seeing my soul screaming for help to become sober and find the reason why I wasn't started piecing my life back together. Two weeks out of the ranch, um, in the Word every day and having one-on-one -on -one time with God, our Lord, and the Holy Spirit, also my fellow brothers, has helped me put away childish things, throw away selfishness, anger, impatience, pride, and has filled, my, filled me with hope and joy. Um, John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now saying this, I just want to praise our Lord Jesus for bringing me back to life and pulling me out of the pit. Father, we thank you for Connor. We thank you for his willingness to allow you to, to work in his life and to bring change and transformation. And Lord, we thank you for this graduation time. Lord, we know it's a time of, of moving into a different time. But Lord, we know that your spirit goes with him and your presence goes with him. So wherever he goes, we pray, Jesus, that you be with him. You'd help him to overcome. You'd give him all of the presence of God. Lord, we just know that you're with him. You just fill him with your spirit, we pray, and use him to your glory. In Jesus' name. always a blessing to, to pray for those at the ranch and to, for what God is doing and continue to keep them in your prayers because, again, you work through a process at Calvary Ranch, but then you go live your life. And, and we all need, not just them, we all need the presence of God to help us be able to live for Christ in the midst of this world. Amen. Let's stand together as we prepare to worship the Lord and I'm praising Him to come and join us as we prepare to worship. Heavenly Father, we give you this day. We ask you, O oh Lord, to fill us with your presence. We ask you, O oh Lord, to, to glorify yourself in, in our midst, Lord. Lord, as we sing praises to you, we pray that your glory will be seen in Jesus' name.
as we focus on the Lord today. Let's continue to worship the Lord this morning.
is when the saints are gathered around the throne and they have their crowns, the, the deed that they have come into their life throughout their life and they serve Jesus and they take those crowns, their glory, and they lay them at the feet of Jesus. Amen. They lay them down before him for he is the one that is worthy of our worship and worship him this morning. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer this morning and as we do, I'm going to go ahead and mute uh, the microphone so that I can uh, see if you don't want to share information over the internet. We record our services so for those that are unable to come and be here in person, I can worship online and so you can find that either on our Facebook page or on our YouTube page. want to share some requests, continue to pray uh, for Beth Hart as she uh, has continued to recover from surgery. Also, as, they, as many of you know, the, the funeral of her father uh, has been moved to May because of the circumstances uh, due to uh, the weather they had up there. So we pray for them. Also, when Natalie Hardman's praying Kinsey, so lift her up in prayer today. It's been good to have Emory back with us as he continues to, to walk through this uh, amount of treatment, but we're so glad he's able to be here, and we just are thankful for that. Uh, many of you know Rich Cole. Rich and Barbara come here over the summer. I live in Wichita in the, in the, in the wintertime. We come out here in the summer. Uh, Rich had knee replacement surgery. It's going well. He wanted me to thank every one of you for your prayers uh, for him. Again, also just are thankful for um, God's blessing and grace in our life with, with Kim's recovery from her treatment for cancer. Also for her, her cousin Caroline as well, uh, who's recovering there. We thank the Lord for that. Continue to pray. Um, as we go forward in dealing with the virus of COVID-19, uh, we're, we're thankful. I, I believe we've got a, a bright summer horizon. I think things are going to be moving in that direction as we see. We can uh, have more and more opportunities to worship the Lord together. But continue to pray for those that are affected, those that are hospitalized, those that are, that are dealing with this to continue to lift them up. Um, we are also looking to expand uh, our children's ministry, and so we're looking for leaders, uh, both for our nursery as well as our older children. Um, specifically, we're looking for someone to be a coordinator and then others that would work with them. And so if you'd pray about that and say, Lord, would that be something that you would want me to do? Would that be something you'd want to uh, engage in my life? And so uh, it's been good. These last few weeks, we've had children running around our sanctuary. Uh, we enjoy that. We enjoy the opportunity. So I want to pray that God would direct us to people to be able to lead uh, that ministry for our church. Any other requests that you have this morning you'd like us to pray about? Pray today that you'd give us everything that we need to do your will. 
Lord, you are our provider. You are the one that cares for us. And so, Lord, we ask today that you would give us our daily bread, that you give us the things that we need so that we might indeed serve you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, Lord, we know that there are bills to be paid. We know there is food to be put on the table. There are, there are things that need to take place. And, Lord, you know all of that. But you've told us not to worry about it, not to be anxious about it, but, Lord, to give it to you. And you'll care for these things. Lord Jesus, we ask today that you would forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lord, we know that, that in our lives we need your grace and mercy. It was on the cross that you shed your blood and, and provided opportunity for our sins to be forgiven. You said if we confess our sin, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Lord, today we pray that you would forgive our sin. So Lord, help us to be a gracious people. Help us to be people that, that give grace to other people. Help us to be people, Lord, that forgive others uh, who have sinned against us. Lord, may we be a forgiving people who forgive others in the same way that you forgave us and washed away our sins. And Lord, we pray today that you'd lead us not into temptation. Lord, we, we, we are thankful for Connor and for Scott and for those who've been in the ranch and through the ranch. And Lord, we pray today that you would lead us away from Lord, we know that Satan is about and he's roaring to seek who he may devour, and that, Lord, he's come to steal, kill, and destroy. But, Lord, you have come that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And so I pray they lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Lord, give us victory, we pray. But, Lord, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And, Lord, you know the request that we mentioned, the, the physical needs that are here. Lord, we pray for Catherine's family and, Lord, for the grandson of of Kathy, Lord, and her family that, that whose life was taken. Lord, we pray that you'd be with that family, Lord, and be with them as they as they grieve and as they as they cope with the circumstances that are there. We pray, Lord, for the Lorenz family and ask, Lord, that you'd be with them as well as they cope with the loss of grief. Lord, we know that loss is difficult, but we pray that your grace and your peace would be there. Lord, we just lift up the names of those this morning that we pray for. We pray for, for Bev and we pray for Kenzie. We pray for Emory and Rich and for Ken, Lord, and for Kim and Caroline. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would touch their bodies and bring healing. Be your great physician. Lord, today we just look to you. Lord, we look as we read your word, we ask that you speak to us by your spirit. And Lord, as we share your word, we pray that your spirit would say exactly what each one of us needs to hear so we can be glory to your name. Lord, we love you today. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help us to hear your voice.
involved with the Church of the Nazarene in 164 rural areas. That means all around the world, the Church of the Nazarene is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, making a difference in the lives of people. I believe Luxembourg was the last country we just entered, uh, that little dinky country in the center of Europe. Uh, but we're there. And we're in Asia, we're in Africa, we're in Australia, we're all around the world, South America, taking the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we receive an Easter offering, a Thanksgiving offering in the fall, or participate through faith promise, what we're doing is we're saying we're not just supporting our local church, but we're reaching out, answering God's call to take the gospel into all the world and make disciples for him. So uh, our goal this year is $800 in this Easter offering. If you'd like to give to that, there's a little uh, envelope, I believe, in, in the seats in front of you. Or if there's not one, just write Easter uh, on your offering envelope, and our, our calendar will know what to do with that. And just pray, how can I help further the gospel, not just in Montrose, but all around the world in the name of Jesus Christ? So I'll ask you that you'll come or receive this morning regular tithes and offerings and also uh, any Easter offering that you might have. If you want to give in the love offering for Luana, just make sure you mark Luana on that. We'll know where that goes uh, as well. So let's just ask God to help us be faithful in our giving. Amen. Heavenly Father, everything we have is yours. Every penny in our bank account, every, every car, every building, Lord, all of these things you've given to us, we might use them for the accomplishment of your purposes and your glory. And Lord, as we give these offerings, we pray, Jesus, that you would guide us by your Holy Spirit. Lead us as to how we might participate in the carrying out of your gospel around the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
what kind of people I can do to be. You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with the promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. Trina Thompson was having trouble finding a job after she'd graduated from a middle college in 2009. There was a severe depression going on in America and jobs were scarce and unemployment was high. It wasn't just that inexperienced recent graduates like Trina were struggling to find work, but rather hordes of workforce veterans were out of work as well. What did Trina do? She blamed her college and sued her alma mater for failing to advance her career. There were five prison inmates in Idaho, and they got together and they made a discovery. The discovery was this, their crimes were different, manslaughter, grand theft, aggravated battery, including shooting a man and drug convictions. But they realized that alcohol was a common component of their crimes and the poor decisions that they had made. So you would think that maybe this was a common awakening and they shared their confession and their honest evaluation of who they were. No, they filed a $1 billion lawsuit against eight large alcohol corporations. They claimed they never would have started drinking as minors if they'd known alcohol was addictive. In their opinion, it was the fault of the brewers not warning them on their bottles that alcohol could be addictive. These are just a few of the warning labels that we have. Have you ever noticed on almost everything that you buy, there's a warning label? For instance, if you go get coffee at McDonald's, it says, warning, coffee may be hot. <laughs> now, the reason that warning label's there is that one day, somebody spilled their coffee in their lap as they were trying to drive away from the drive-thru. But it was McDonald's fault that the coffee was too hot and burned them. You see, there's a common theme here in all of these things, and that is we tend to want to avoid responsibility for our actions. We want to blame someone else for what's going on in our life rather than taking a good look at ourselves as to why these things are taking place. We've been studying the distant country in Luke chapter 15 and looking at the story of the prodigal son. And when we get to the distant country, it's real easy to blame someone else for us being there rather than looking at what God wants to do in our lives. We're presented with a choice when we're in the distant country. We can choose to accept responsibility and move towards healing, or we can avoid the obvious and live in the denial of our circumstances. We're gonna pick up our reading this morning of Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 17. And this is what Jesus says. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will sit out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. As we look at this story of the prodigal son, we see a young man who had everything going for him. He had a wonderful family. He had an inheritance that was fairly significant. And he had the opportunity to go forward in life. But he had some issues. The issues were he didn't like his dad telling him what to do. He didn't like the way things were going. And he was impatient to receive that inheritance that he was going to be given. So he went to his father. And he said, Dad, I want my inheritance now. I'm not going to wait till you die. 
I'm not going to wait till I get it in the normal and crowd thing. I want my inheritance now so I can enjoy it. That doesn't sound like our, our culture today. Give me what I want now so I can enjoy it now so that I don't have to worry about tomorrow. So that's what he did. He got his inheritance, and it says that he went to the distant country and squandered it in wild living. Now, I don't know what wild living meant to him back in Jesus' day, but we know what wild living looks in our day. In other words, he went and he had fun partying. Do you remember in the news recently that there was this big party in Boulder? A bunch of students got up on College Hill, and, and they decided they were going to party in rebellion against their right to party. They felt like that somehow that, that the college and, and everybody around them had, had crimped their style. That they couldn't party. They, they had, as the song says, a right to party. So they did. Overturned police cars, damaged property, created a huge mess. Some of them are facing legal charges. The reason I bring that up is, is that's kind of where our prodigal son was. He found himself amongst a group of people who would encourage him in his wild living. Who would, who would come alongside him and say, yeah, this is fun. Let's go do that. You know? Um, isn't that typical? Someone says, well, this is fun. Let's try that. And then we get hurt and we wonder why we tried it. That's where he lived. Where we are today in the story of the prodigal son is when he came to his senses. When he realized that his life was not going the direction that it needed to go. And he was having all kinds of issues. He had spent all his money. His friends left with the money. And he found himself feeding pigs as a Jewish boy and thinking the slop looked good. Now, I said it earlier this week. I grew up on a farm. My brother raised pigs. That slop never looked good. I mean, I, there's another time I looked at that and said, pig, move over, pig. I want some food. But that's where he was. That's where he was. That's where he ended up in the midst of that. So today we're going to talk about brutal honesty. And that means that if we're ever going to have a different life, if we're ever going to live differently than we are now, we can't blame someone else. It can't be our neighbor's fault. It can't be our parents' fault. It can't be anybody else's fault. We have to say to ourselves, we need God. And we need God to do a work in us. So the first thing we need to realize today, we're talking about brutal honesty, is that brutal honesty doesn't make excuses. <clears throat> brutal honesty doesn't make excuses. He said, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no, worthy, no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He said, I know what I have done. I know where I have ended up. And so I, I look back at the Father's house. We talked about that one of the things about this awakening is we look back to where we came from and where we could go. Well, he's looking back at where he came from and where he could go, and he realizes, I could go back to Dad. I could go back to Dad's house, and I could go back to Dad's house, and I could find this opportunity to be fed. I wouldn't have to eat slop. I could eat good food. But he says, I'm not worthy. I know the choices I've made. I know where I've ended up. And I don't have the right to go back to my dad and pretend that it never happened. You see, sin always takes us farther than we want to go. We stay longer than we ever want to. And it does more damage than we ever think. When we walk into a sinful lifestyle, it creates issues in our lives that we continue to work with. So in a distant country, we have a choice. We can choose to look for God's help, or we can choose to justify why we're there. We love to do that. We, we go to great lengths to tell ourselves something other than the truth. To keep an illusion going rather than to get honest about our reality. And we're willing to use all sorts of methods to justify why life is really okay when it's not. Here's some of the tricks that we use to deceive ourselves and deny reality. One of them is simply this. We deny to accept the facts. You know, denial. You know, I, I dropped a, a concrete block on my foot. It doesn't hurt. Got a broken toe, but it doesn't hurt. 
You know, ever done that? Or are you over it? I remember walking up to my, my mom one time when I was a, a, just a, a kid. Uh, we weren't always good kids. We didn't always treat the equipment the way we should have. So we left things lying around the yard, like pitchforks. And I remember one day when I was probably in fourth or fifth grade, we were playing, we were having a good time, we were running around, and all of a sudden I noticed something. I found a pitchfork. You know how I found it? It's in my ankle. And it went through the front of my ankle and out the back. Now, I could say I don't have a problem, but I didn't know how to get it out. Now, remember, I'm nine or ten. I'm a little bit freaked out that I found this pitchfork. So I grabbed a hold of the handle and walked up to the house and asked my aunt mom, how do I get this thing out of my leg? I don't have a problem, but there's obviously a pitchfork saying that I do. Denial. Denial of reality. Denial of the fact that our finances are messed up because I charge a credit card too much. Denial of the fact that, that I'm not making good decisions because I'm choosing to drink alcohol. Denial of the fact that anything else going on in my life surely couldn't be my fault. It must be my wife's. It must be my husband's. It must be my kids. It surely couldn't be my choices. Another thing that we do is we tend to disagree. Uh, and disagreement has less to do with the facts and more to be with what we want it to be true. You ever wonder why we have the, name, the thing of fake news? It's because we have certain beliefs that we want to believe are true, whether the facts support them or not. We're willing to lie to ourselves about reality and what we believe if we means we get something that we want. I can believe that this is true because I want this. The old adage, don't bother me with the fact my mind is already made up. That's one of the mindsets of the distant country. Another mindset is defensiveness. It reveals that we're living in an area where we're in denial. We choose to point the finger at someone else to avoid pointing the finger at ourselves. We choose to say that it's not me. You remember Trina? I don't have a job because my college didn't prepare me. Or the five inmates that said, it surely couldn't have been our poor choices. It must be the fact that alcohol was made. You see, defensiveness. Have you ever had somebody ask you an honest question, but you didn't want to give them an honest answer? What's on your computer? What TV shows are you watching? Where did you go? What's on your phone? You see, I, I got to confess today, this wasn't the sermon I was looking forward to preaching. Because I know that the Holy Spirit says, well, wait a second, what about you? And that's the truth. All of us have to look at ourselves and ask God, the Holy Spirit, to say, as it says in Psalm 139, search me, O God, and know my heart, and see if there be any wicked way in me. <laughs> Defensiveness. I've discovered that this is one of the reasons why some people don't come to church. Because when they come to church, they are reminded about what's not right in their life. One, one girl put it this way. She said, when I went to college, I started partying. I guess that's about the time I stopped going to church. Or I started dating this guy, and it wasn't long after that I stopped going to church. My marriage was falling apart, and I filed for divorce. Then I stopped going to church. Defensiveness. Not wanting anybody to ask me the tough questions because I really don't want to give an honest answer. We avoid the people and the places that might confront us with the truth. And we blame somebody else. We put the focus of our sin on somebody else. Society is masterful at that. If your marriage doesn't meet your expectations, it must be my spouse's fault. If your child rebels, it must be somebody else's fault. The economy, your job, there's a famine in the land. I'm eating pig slop. Surely it must be somebody else's fault. Kyle Eidelman tells this story. He says, one day I was in the parking lot at Walmart. And I was in the parking lot, and it looked like it was going to rain. And, and so I was in a hurry to get from the store to the car. 
So I went there and I unlocked my door and I grabbed the hold of the door and the wind caught it. And there was this nice Toyota Camry sitting beside and my door just went whack against the Camry. He says, well, that's gonna be expensive. He gets his card out, he puts his insurance information down. He, he lays it there because he doesn't know where the guy is that's there. And so he leaves his information. He's gonna pay for the Camry. A few days later, he called his insurance agent to let him know what had happened. He explained the thing, he said, I was getting in the car, I grabbed a hold of the door, and the wind caught it, and it hit the other guy's car. The insurance agent said this, he said, it's not your fault. He said, there's no way it cannot be my fault. I was the one that opened the door. He said, no, that's what we call an act of God. The door caught it, the wind caught it, and he goes, really? I can blame God for this? <laughs> Turns out that an act of God is a legal term. Right, Daryl? It's in our insurance policy. So instead of, instead of taking responsibility for parking too close and not hanging onto the door tight enough, I could blame God. Projection. It's somebody else's fault. As long as we continue to say it's not my fault and blame our parents, our spouses, our bosses, our exes, our friends, transformation will never happen. I'll bring you a story from scripture. Adam and Eve were in the garden. They had been created. Adam had been created first. They had been created later. They were in the garden. They said, there's only one thing you can't do. Don't eat of the tree in the middle of the garden. Well, Eve got there. And Satan tempted her. And she ate. And she called Adam over. And he ate. And they realized they were naked and got some fig leaves and covered themselves up. Later on, God was walking in the garden. And he said this simple question, where are you? Now, that question is a pretty simple question, right? Unless, of course, you're hiding from God. And so Adam answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And God said, well, who told you you were naked? never told you you were naked. Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you to eat from, not to eat from? And here's what happened. The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit of the tree and I ate it. He didn't say, Lord, I messed up. I, 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 I chose to eat this fruit that was handed to me. No, it's my wife's fault. So he asked the woman, what have you done? And she said, I'm so sorry. I, I ate of that fruit and I shouldn't have. Would you please do it? No, she said, the serpent deceived me. And I ate. Everybody else's fault, including God, everything else but me. When we are in the distant country, it is real easy to post blame. God came to the garden to redeem Adam and Eve to bring restoration to them, to bring relationship to them, and they hid because they had sinned. Can I tell you this morning, God's not in the business of seeking to find you so he can destroy you. God's in the business of seeking to find you so he can redeem you, so he can heal you, so he can forgive you, so he can bring grace into your life. The problem is many of us are running from God even though he's the one with the answer. It's kind of like running away from the doctor. When I was a kid, we were getting inoculations as little kids, and there's four of us. I'm the oldest, my sister's the youngest. There's two brothers in between. Doctor comes in the room and he says, well, who wants to be first? We all point my sister, she does. We didn't want the shot. The scripture says in John 3 and verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. If we're willing to stop running from God and come back to the distant country, God is willing to bring grace, forgiveness, and healing. But we must choose to come. That brings me to my second point. Brutal honesty requires confession and responsibility. Confession and responsibility. At this point in his life, the prodigal was willing to honestly confront his sinful actions. He recognized that he had wronged his father and, and had wronged God, and he didn't deserve a second chance. But he was willing to ask for one. 
I want to say this to you this morning. Our sinful choices never just affect us. It affects our family. It affects our co-workers. It affects the community around us. Every sinful choice we make affects someone else. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says this. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. I've always found this to be a very interesting passage of Scripture. Because what it tells me is that holiness and relationship are connected. How we relate with other people is connected to how we relate with God. And how we relate with God is connected to how we relate with other people. And we cannot separate them. We love to say, well, I have a great relationship with God, but my brother, man, he's a pain. I mean, I, I have a great relationship with God, but, you know, I just can't live with that woman. Or I can't live with that man. My kid. You see, we can't separate that. He says to love one another as I have loved you. To love our spouse as I have loved you. To love our kids as I have loved you. To love our church people as I have loved you. To love the world, to love people as I have loved you. We can't separate our holy walk with God from our relationship with people. 1 John 1, 7 says, We walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You never sin alone. Your sin always affects someone else. We're familiar with the story of David and Bathsheba. Let me just give you a brief rundown on it. David and Bathsheba. David was uh, not where he was supposed to be. The kings all go to war in the spring. David didn't do that. David's at his house. He's scrolling through the internet. I mean, he's looking down across the balcony. And he sees this woman who's taking a bath. He's struck by her. He sends someone to find out who she is. And the guy comes back. He says, that is Bathsheba, the, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, one of his soldiers. So he sent for her. She was married. So was David. He brought her into his house. Committed adultery. She went back home. And verse 5 of 2 Samuel chapter 11 says, The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. Talk about an awakening. Talk about brutal honesty. David thought, well, this is just a one-night stand. This is someone I can, I, can, I can relate to, and all of a sudden, pregnancy occurs. To cover his sin, David had Uriah, her husband, killed. Put him in their very front of the battle so that he couldn't escape. Once she had uh, gone through her mourning period, he took her as his wife. So therefore, since she was his wife, the child will be his, not somebody else's. And he lived in denial for a year. You see, we, we go from second chapter or second Samuel eleven to second chapter or second Samuel twelve pretty quickly. You know, eleven chapter twelve, turn the page. There's a year in there that David lived in his sin. On the outside, everything looked good. He reigned successfully. He penned psalms. He won wars. But he never acknowledged his sin. God gave him a year. How long has God given you? It's still there. You're still dealing with it. But you haven't acknowledged it to God. Finally, in 2 Samuel 12, God sent the prophet Nathan. And he gives this story about sheep. He says, Here's this one guy. He's got all kinds of sheep in the pen. He's got numerous sheep. There's this one guy that has one sheep. And he loves him to death. He's my named him. And he's just this really pet sheep. But the guy with all the sheep has a visitor come. And he wants to prepare a, a meal of mutton. So he doesn't take from all the sheep of his. He takes this other guy's sheep. David is so angry that someone would even do that. He said he must pay for that lamb four times because he did such a thing and had no pity. 
And Nathan looks at David and says, you're the man. Or here in King James English, thou art the man. However you want to put it, he put his finger right on him and said, David, you've had a year and God's not let me get away with it. David came to a point of brokenness. The scripture that Jim read for us this morning out of Psalm 51 is a wonderful scripture. Read the whole chapter. We didn't read the whole thing. Read the whole chapter. And David says, have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. If you're walking apart from God, your sin will never leave you. It will always sit on that shoulder reminding you of what you did. Sin against you and you only have I sinned and done what's right and done what's evil in your sight, so that you're right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me, yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in the secret place. And here's David's prayer. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I'll be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. David was broken. I'm afraid sometimes we, we, we want to skirt past brokenness. We don't want to own up to our sin because it breaks our heart. It breaks God's heart when we sin. You see, sin is so offensive to God because of what it does to his creation. God created us in his image. In the image of God, we're created in his likeness. And sin mars the image of God. It breaks the creation of God and it breaks the heart of God. Here's the point. When we are in the distant country and we're denying and we're doing all that other stuff, our heart's not yet broken. But when God breaks our heart, we come to our senses and realize there's hope. David says in Psalm 51, 17, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God will not despise. You see, the greatest thing that can ever happen to you is that your sin would be found out. And that God would break your heart, not because you got caught. I, I, I raised kids. I know the difference between being sorry for what you did and being sorry you got caught. Okay? I understand that difference. And many times we're only sorry we got caught, not sorry that we did what we did. God wants to bring us to a point like he did this prodigal son and say to us, your sin broke my heart, but I still love you. In fact, I love you so much that I sent my son Jesus to the cross to shed his blood, to die on the cross that your sins might be forgiven. For while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Third thing I want to tell you this morning is this. Brutal honesty brings us to a moment of decision. Every time we deal with sin, we have to decide what are we going to do about it. The prodigal son came to the point looking at the slop of the pigs and said, I can choose to stay here and make the best of it, or I can go home to my father. And that's what he chose to do. And we'll get into it a little bit later in this next couple of weeks. But he went back to the father and he enjoyed the father's love and they had a great celebration because he had made the decision to come home and his father forgave him and showed him his love. But he had to come to the end of himself first. Now this morning it says there's one thing that you're going to do. Excuse me. It's one thing to say what you're going to do. It's another thing to do it. Uh, in the devotional, I've been reading that Kyle Eidel does tell this story of bungee jumping. You see, a group of high school students went out to, to, to see this bungee jumping place. And they all kind of gathered around, and some of them had paid their money, and they were going to watch their classmates bungee jump. He thought he'd be really brave. He said, I would do that, but I wouldn't pay $40 to do it. He heard a rustling behind him. It was another one of his female classmates. A girl comes up and says, would this $20 help? He was stuck. You see, he couldn't say he wouldn't do it 
And he couldn't say, well, I still won't even do it for 20 bucks. He said, I had to do it. I had some pride. I had to make sure I, my friends didn't see me. So he walks up to the platform, puts his 20 bucks with her 20 bucks. He gets in line, and here's what he says. He says, I told myself, it's not that high. But once the platform was a grand lever and I stepped aboard, I began to be nervous. It rose higher and higher. Oh, by the way, I'm scared of heights. Finally, the crane lurched to a halt, and he said, I stepped to the edge and I made a horrible choice. I looked down. Never looked down. He was paralyzed with fear, and he didn't know what to do. So he turned around to the crane operator and he said, um, I just can't do it. Would you give me a shove? Apparently this had happened before. He says, uh, legally I can't. I can't push you off. He says, you have a choice. You can either jump or you can ride the platform down. Well, he wasn't going to ride the platform down. And finally, after a while, the guy says, you know, if you close your eyes and fall, anybody can do that. So he closed his eyes and he fell and he bungee jumped. He made a decision and he acted on it. You see, that's what we're trying to get to in this series. If we want an aha moment, if we want our lives to be transformed, if we want to be different, there's three things that go into that. Go ahead and go to that next slide, Elizabeth. It's like a door with three hinges. Some of you people do construction, you understand that. You need all three hinges. The first hinge is awakening. I begin to awaken to myself and recognize that my life is not where I want it to be. The second hinge is the hinge that we're talking about, that, that hinge of brutal honesty, where I look at myself and I'm not going to let myself off the hook. I'm going to be open. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to confess my sin. And the last one is I take immediate action. It says in the story of the prodigal son, so he got up. He didn't stay down at the trough. He didn't try to justify why the food looked good. He didn't try to explain that why he was where he was. He simply got up and returned to the Father. You see, that's the question we have to ask ourselves this morning. God, the Holy Spirit, is already here. He's already talking to us in our heart. We're hearing a voice that we're familiar with, and he's talking about something in our lives that we're familiar with. The question is, is what are we going to do about it? It's one thing to be awakened. It's another to act. It's one thing to be on the platform. It's another to jump off. If God is talking to you today, it's a good time to jump off into the arms of the Father and let him hear you and receive you. And it says... Got up. There's a big difference between he came to his senses and he got up. It's one thing to know, it's another thing to act. So, my question this morning is this is what action do you need to take in order to be obedient to what the Holy Spirit is saying to you right now, today, in this place? Not next week, not last week. But today, I believe God, the Holy Spirit, is having a conversation. And he's saying to you, here's where you are. Perhaps you're honest enough to say, yes, I agree with you, Lord. That's where I am. What do you want me to do about it? And he's laying it out. The question is, will you be obedient? That's what he asks you to do. Let's stand together. Invite our praise team to come this morning. We're going to sing a closing song. It, it, it's fairly familiar to us. It's one that we have sung before. The song is simply, I surrender all. Surrender and yieldedness brings redemption and forgiveness. And so this morning, whatever it is God's talking to you about, we have these things called altars here today. These altars, there's nothing special about them. They're, they're nice. They're nice, good altars. What's special about them is, is who you meet down here. See, when we come to the altar, we come to God and say, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Just make me a hand man. Just make me a servant. I just want to be near you. And God says, I love you. 
I want to restore your relationship with me. I want you to become a son again. I love you. And in fact, I sent Jesus on the cross to die for your sins so you can continue that relationship. What you've got to do this morning is surrender your pride. Surrender your sin. And ask Jesus to bring you forgiveness. To confess our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we're willing to confess, he's willing to forgive. The choice is with us. We're going to sing together this morning. And as we sing, I invite you to come and take a place at this altar. If God's talking to you, nobody else needs to know. Don't they just said in Psalm 51, if you get you, O Lord, I sin. So you have a conversation with God. It starts there. Now, if he says, by the way, you need to talk to so-and-so, that's between you and God. But today, let's not sing. Heavenly Father, help us today. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. Bring your voice of reality to us. And help us to know the grace that is offered to us. In Jesus' name. And let's sing together. If you'd like to pray, the altar is open. just a reassertion of your own will. The flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. And when we come and pray at an altar like this, we're not asking God to help me to, to, to pull myself up by my bootstraps and be better. We're surrendering our will to God so he can make us better. That he can do a work in our heart that's better than we could ever do ourselves. It is a yieldedness to God. In Romans 12 it says, I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service of worship. And don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you can test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We'll never live like Christians unless Jesus, the Christ, changes our heart. We'll never be like him unless he does something in us. We can't do it. He must do it. But we must surrender so the Holy Spirit can transform our lives. We must sing one more verse today. That's going to be all we sing unless the Spirit urges otherwise. But if God is speaking today, don't walk out the door without it. Bring it to Jesus and let him offer forgiveness. Let's sing that third verse. <laughs>
gift of all that we are, that you would wash it in the blood of Jesus, that you would transform our heart from the inside out, and you'd help us to be like Christ. Lord Jesus, this morning I pray that you'd be with these who are praying this morning, that Lord, you would do the work in their hearts and lives, and that Lord, they would rise again to live in the power of your resurrection. And Lord, I pray for all of us today that we too would yield to Christ, that we would kneel before him and rise in the power of his resurrection. Filled with his Holy Spirit to be all that he created and redeemed us to be. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you'd like to remain as we pray. Um, I'll hang out here at the front for a little bit. If you'd like to talk to me, pray about something, God bless you. Bible study will take place in the Fellowship Hall. Um, we're going to try to begin by 1130, be done by 1215. We are dismissed.